Awesome, guys, if you want to open up your Bibles, please, to Daniel chapter 2. We are going to be continuing our series of Without Compromise in the book of Daniel. Uh, First of all, I just want to say it has been an amazing service so far. Uh, Raph, you did an awesome welcome that really just showed us the kingdom. That was great. Um, Just an amazing communion. Um, I, I definitely touched my heart. We're going to miss you a lot. Um, and just thank you so much for sharing your heart in communion and just uh, helping us to understand contribution and well as all our responsibilities as we follow Christ. Um, like I said, we are going to be continuing the series in Daniel without compromise. Last week we talked about faithful in exile, meaning that we may be in exile in our societies, our faith may be exiled, meaning that we're on the outskirts of societies and that, that we're getting pointed at, but we can still be faithful to God. You know, in chapter 2, we're just going to start in verse 1 and get kind of what's happening at this point as Daniel and his three friends come into exile and now what's starting to happen. It sees here in verse 1, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar, that is the king, had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, the enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. And the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the the dream, and we'll interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses burn into a pile of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, let the king tell his servants a dream and we'll interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are just trying to gain time. Because you realize that what, uh, excuse me, that this is what I firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, this is the only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. Chapter 1 seemed going pretty well for Daniel and his friends. Chapter 2 things have escalated super quickly. (laughs) Zero to a hundred, like just in a snap of an eye right here. You know, and it talks about here, the king is having these dreams that just keep him awake and he's getting so worked up about it that he starts threatening people's lives. Starts demanding the world. Hopefully nobody feels like this is their boss or their professor or their preacher. Somebody who's demanding unrealistic things, demanding the world from them and going like, I don't know what to do. You know, this same king that last chapter brought Daniel and his three friends to a place of honor is the same king that's now threatening their lives. There are no promises in the world. No promises in the world. And this is the same king and he's freaking out. Why is he going so crazy? Because people's lives were getting seriously threatened because he wanted his dream interpreted. He was freaking out about this dream. Have you ever had a dream that made you stay awake? Some of us, right? I'm pretty sure we didn't like threaten somebody the next morning though. But I know even for myself, like we can have dreams that, that can scare us a little bit. We don't know what it means. Or, you know, we, we have a, a dream of a family member. I know uh, not too long ago, I talked to Tegan about a dream that kept me awake one night. And it was so super pity, but I don't know why it like stressed me out at like two o'clock in the morning. I had a dream. I used to work at McDonald's. I had a dream that I was doing really bad in the drive through and the customers were getting mad at me and the orders were getting wrong and it was blocked up and I legit woke up like three times that night going like, I gotta get it right, you know? (laughs) I haven't worked at McDonald's for like eight years but still it's like, you know, we freak out sometimes about things that we can feel. Averagely, people dream about five dreams a night. And they wake up and they, 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 they think about it. And we think about it so much that we want to tell people. You know, a fun, interesting fact, though. Uh, psychologists have found this out. The worst topic that you can ever have in a conversation is talk to them about your dreams. It's the worst conversation you can ever have. Why? Because there's zero relatability. You know, if I'm talking to you about, like, I dreamt, like, a dog parachuted out of a boat. You know, Siona couldn't come to me. Man, I relate, bro. Like, uh, my dog last week, like, just jumped out of the car. Right? Like, it doesn't work. So 
So use that as you will if you kind of are in a conversation you don't want to be in. Just talk, start talking about your dreams. Uh, but right, we, we feel a lot about like our visions and our dreams and what things mean. But first of all, we do have to understand not all dreams are from God. Mm. Not all dreams are from God. The dog parachuting out of the boat doesn't mean God's trying to like, hey, save, save uh, little, little Luna here. Uh, but you know, Jeremiah 23, 25 through 30, uh, 28 talks about this a little bit of how people can misuse dreams for their own gain. Jeremiah is talking about this, and or God speaking through Jeremiah. I have heard what the prophets who say prophecy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream. I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams that they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their ancestors forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophets who have a dream recount the dream, but let those who have my word speak it faithfully. There was just this encouragement when it came to dream that, hey, if you're going to dream, dream, whatever. But he's like, if you have my word, that's all that matters. Yeah. And there's a misunderstanding in the world where they, they try and go on the side of speculation rather than just scripture. Yeah. He's like, have my word, be faithful to that. Yeah. And so he's freaking out. This king is freaking out because he's having this dream that he really feels like it's having a meaning. He's having this same dream over and over again. And he starts to worry because he wants to know the future. He wants to know, what does this mean? What's going to happen? You know, how many of us freak out because we do not know the future? Yeah. We do not know what's going to happen. We do not what, know what they're going to feel or what they're going to say or what's gonna, what, what is the interaction going to be like. You know, usually our present faith is tested by an unseen future. Our present faith is usually tested by an unseen future. So what do these astrologers say? This king's freaking out. Verse 10. The astrologers answer the king. There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked for such a thing of any magi uh, magician or an enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. So they come up to him and say, we can't do it. You know, to be honest, even in our own lives, whether it's a dream, whether it's what someone said or what someone did or someone changes their status on Facebook, we all start to worry what it means. Right? Have you ever done that where you see somebody change their photo that used to be them and their boyfriend and now they're just single on their profile photo and you're like, what does that mean? You know, what happened? Right? We all start to worry of what, what's going on in our lives because we worry about what the future holds. And to be honest, people have been trying to predict the future ages ago. Forever. It's always been in humankind to try and understand what the future holds. It's big business. You know, many people look through astronomy to find, figure out, to cope with the world, right? You'll go and ask, hey, are you Pisces or Cancer or whatever conversation they'll get into? Like, what's going to happen? Even nowadays, it, throughout 2020 to 2022, there has been a record number of Christian books that deal with prophecy that have been sold. Because they, they're looking at the world and like, COVID, is it the end of the world? You know, there's a volcano, an earthquake, and all these things. And people are buying record, record numbers about books about prophecy. Everyone's freaking out. You know, and we do that. We freak out when we do not know what's going to happen. Because there's this understanding that the less we know, the more we fear. You know, driving is not hard, right? You, most of you drove your way here or whatever. Dr try driving with your eyes closed. <laughs> I, I, that's hard. Even do this. I know I, I kind of randomly do it with Tegan every now and then, um, where I'll close my eyes while we're walking down the street and hold her hand. Uh, for the first, like, 20 steps, I'm usually, like, quite confident because I know what's going on. But after a while, I'm like, you know, <laughs> like, like, oh, super scared. She's like, just come, you know? Like, I'm going to protect you. I, I promise you, try and do that, like, in an open field. You know for the next five minutes you're safe. I promise you, you won't get an, another minute. You're just scared about what's going to happen. Because we fear things not even in our own lives of what's going to happen. We fear what's going to happen to the person to our left, mm. to our right. We want to know things that don't even matter to us. Mm -hmm. Have you ever got into like halfway through a conversation someone's having, and you really deeply want to know what's going on? <laughs> you know, and the person's like, this has nothing to do with you. You're like, I didn't ask that. I just want to know what's happening. <laughs> right? we, we just want to know what's going on. And people do that all the time. Time, that they knew it for sure. Even at this time, they're like, we know we really can't do this. If you tell us a dream, we can, we can, make, this, we can make it up. But we, we don't really know what's happening. You know, and, and why do we keep trying? 
Why, why do we keep trying to do this even though we don't really know what's going on? You know, and they say, hey, we, we can't do it. But to be honest, if I was them, I would at least guessed, <laughs> right? I'm about to die. <laughs> like, Bob, like, do a, do a good guess. Uh, you know, you, had a, you dreamt a crab and umbrellas, right? Like, like, do something to guess. But even throughout the, the, the known human race, we've, we've always tried to guess the future. Even in the Roman times, they had, a, uh, they had a thing where they would try and prophesy the future by how chickens eat. And this was dead serious. They would make like huge decisions about this. I put a link in the like right here for you. Um, they would literally look at, at um, how chickens eat. If they ate too fast, that means something was going to happen quickly. If they ignored the food, they're like maybe it's not really going to happen or not. They, they made serious decisions based off of this. You know, there's there's a lot of many other ways that people have tried to predict the future. And I'm not going to try and pronounce any of these, but um, <laughs> you know, divination by arrows, where the arrow would fly. They try to do that. They would listen to people's stomach noises and figure out what does that mean. You know, they would look at the movement of mice, how long your fingernails were, the knots on an umbilical cord, random selections of a line of poetry to try and figure out what's going on. And one of my favorite here is divination by cheese. I haven't looked it up yet, but I'm pretty interested of how they did that. All in all, we at least all have to agree it's clear to everyone. We completely have no idea what we're getting ourselves into. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody knows. No one knows. We, we can guess. There are sports analysts that say, hey, these people are going to Nobody knows a thing. And yet, that's where they were coming to. They're like, we all don't know. But they did say a truth in there, except God. They said, nobody knows except God. See, we may not know what the future holds, but we know that God holds the future. Yeah. My title of my lesson this morning is we're going to see Daniel start to have faith in the future. On, yeah. Title of my lesson is Faithful with the Future. Yeah. Point number one, prayer and praise changes everything. Prayer and praise changes everything. In your uh, emails, the points are switched around because uh, I thought this is better. Uh, but yeah, starting in verse 12. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. He's like, you guys can't do it. I'm killing everybody. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death. And the men were sent back to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officers, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he may interpret the dream for him. Again, we read here that the king was furious. He was angry. He was mad, mainly because he couldn't get what he wanted. And so he decided, I'm, I'm killing everybody because of this. I don't know what's happening, so I'm, I'm just killing everyone. And to be honest, this was not a well-thought-out plan to display his power so that people would fear him. This was not what he was doing. He wasn't like just fed up with everybody. This was purely a decision that was made out of emotions. He was angry, and so he decided just to kill everyone. These were people that were associates or, or um, you know, wise people that were helping him make decisions. He's like, whatever, I don't care about that anymore. I'm just going to kill everybody. We do the same thing, don't we? We make horrible decisions when it's just based off of our emotions. Yeah. When it's just strictly based off of our emotions. We just make the worst decisions ever. We throw out logic. We throw out faith. We don't care what the Bible says anymore. We just got something in our heart. and We just, I'm going to do this. You know, we do all that and we just go out and make a mistake. You know, if you think about even your life and you go like, man, what are the decisions that I just made out of pure emotion? I remember there was this time back in uh, the ministry back in Sydney. So I lived in Sydney for about like five years or so. I was studying the Bible with a couple different people throughout that week. And to be honest, by the end of the week, I was just frustrated because some of these people just were like, I don't know, they just weren't seeking God. They weren't reading the Bible. And I started to get self-righteous. I don't know what was going on in my heart. I was emotional. And uh, so I started studying the Bible with somebody. And he just started talking about, man, it's hard to wake up. Like, you know, I'm really trying. And I, I can't really read my Bible. And out of pure emotion, and the emotion was not love, um, <laughs> I was just like, bro, I don't care anymore. Um, read your Bible or not it doesn't affect me. <laughs> I, I was just done with it. I was like, I don't care. Like, he's like, you know, I'm just really trying. 
you're not trying hard enough, bro. Come back if you really want to study the Bible. Um, so he didn't come back. Um, but but I, I was just emotional. I was just like tired of it. I was like, I'm just done with this. You know, and sometimes people, you know, overanalyze emotions. It's kind of funny. Even people want to decide to become a Christian based off emotions. They, they actually are waiting for some emotion to come and then they'll become a Christian. You know, so many people are desperately wanting to base that decision off emotion. You know, they're like, well, I know it's true, I know it's right, but I just don't feel it. You know, and usually that's non-religious people, because religious people, at least for myself, I've done the all emotion following God. And where did that get us? That got me nowhere. I, I, I sang the songs, I worshipped, I raised my hand, I even went hula sometimes, you know. Uh, um, all those emotional things, they got me nowhere. Until I realized that this was true and I'm going to follow it. Come on, come on. You know, that's what we have to do. Yeah. You know, we can freak out when we don't know what's happening. You know, I was even thinking, it was kind of funny. Myself, Siona, and Raph, we went out praying yesterday. Just, I just decided, like, I just want to pray for everybody in the church. And so we went out, prayed for a good two hours or so. But it was about 10 a.m., uh, excuse me, 9 a.m. in the morning. And if you remember, it was a bit raining that time. And uh, we sort of started walking kind of towards the bay in Mission Bay in the city. And uh, the rain, you know, always kind of comes sideways in Auckland, so like slapping the side of your face. Um, but uh, I don't know about you. If you know me, I don't care. <laughs> And I'm just like, keep going. But there were a couple times that Siona and Raph kind of looked at me, rain slapping the side of their face, like, are we still doing this? Uh, <laughs> they both looked at me a couple times, like, are, are we still praying? But after like 20 minutes, the rain went away. It was an awesome time of prayer. But we can kind of be like that. Like, are, are, are we, what are we, we going to do? What's going to happen? Right? We have to be able to make a decision based off of God and nothing else. Yeah. Verse 17 through 19, we're going to see, what does Daniel do, though? There's, there's a lot of challenges happening in his faith. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. I, re I really love these scriptures right here. First of all, he goes and tells his friends what's about to happen. That this was not some idle threat. Mm. This wasn't some prediction, a decree by a king. Mm -hmm. A decree, it, it would have been written in law that this is what's going to happen, this is what he decided. How many of us would have just stopped hoping there? Well, the king signed it. Yeah. What, what, what is there to do? He even told the astrologers that nothing's going to change. Hmm. He said that. He, he already confirmed that. You know, how do you act when there's a decree in your life? Someone says, you can't get the visa. Someone says, don't go to church. I decreed it. You can't do it. They say, you can't get the day off. Trying to ask and put God's church first. No. The boss says, no, you can't do it. I'll fire you if you do. They say, you can't be a leader. You can't grow. You can't change. And they decree it in your life. How do you react? You know, I think everybody needs a million in their life. <laughs> I, I, I've never seen Millie back down from a decree, you know? And I, even I'm sitting on the sideline like, Millie, calm down, you know? <laughs> I heard just recently we have a sister that's um, in Samoa, and she's trying to go back to America, and her visa's not really going through. And, you know, Millie's over here, admin and everything here, and I just hear Millie just calling them up and like, no, I'm not getting off the phone until you change it. I'm like, dang, I thought I was American, you know? And, uh, <laughs> but right, we, 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 we can sometimes start to back down when somebody decrees, well, they said it. What, what do you want me to do? My, my mom said it. My, my, the, my boss said it. Sometimes it's not other people making the bad decrees. It's us. Yeah. Nah, I, I don't want to do that. I won't forgive. I'm not getting open with that sin. I won't become a leader. I'm not going to serve. I'm not going to talk to them. We start to making our own decrees, thinking, I'm not going to do this. But what did Daniel do? What did he do to solve this? Did he come together and like, guys, we have a lot of wisdom and everything like God gave us. He didn't rely on that. He solved it in prayer. That there was going to be some begging, complete humility before God right here. And he got them to join him in prayer as well. See, I don't know how the friends were reacting at this moment, but at least it does say that Daniel had to urge them to do this. Like, guys, quickly, come on, we got to bow down to God and ask him for mercy. 
You know, I, I don't know how they would have been reacting, but at least I know how maybe I would have reacted. Given into despair. Dang, we're done. The king said it. They're coming for us now. It's over. Maybe they started thinking, trying to think their way out of it and start of, instead of praying. They're like, they, they started just putting it in their own head. Man, guys, how are we going to get rid of this instead of just going to God? Maybe they tried to run or hide, lock themselves away in the door and just go, you know, we, we can't deal with this. Now, do you believe that God can change the decrees in your life? Not just the decrees of what other people say, but even your heart as well. The decrees that you make in your heart. Because what this sounds to me is, I don't know if Daniel came there super faithful and everything. Daniel sounds like he's quite afraid, actually. I know later on in the chapters, his life is going to be tested and put on the line, and he's willing to kind of face that. As we continue the, the series of Daniel, we'll see that. But at this point in time, it's quite different. He asked them to pray specifically for their lives. He's like, I'm, I'm afraid of dying, guys. We have to pray for mercy that we are safe. I don't care about anybody else. I'm afraid of dying. You know, and we see here though, that he knew what to do, though. Philippians 4, verse 6, teaches us what he did in his heart. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Yeah. Present your request to God. See, in the previous chapter, it does, t it does teach us that Daniel had the ability to understand dreams, but nowhere does it say that he knows how to read people's minds. Yeah. It says he can interpret dreams, but he doesn't know how to read minds. This was straight needed to come from God. Yeah. Yeah. And he understood that. He's like, maybe he was confident even interpreting a dream, but he's like, I don't know what the dream is. I don't know. I have to go to God. And what's awesome here is that the mystery was revealed to him, and then he got his answer at night. It doesn't tell us what time at night, but it does give us a little bit of a hint. He received a vision instead of a dream. Now, why is that cool to recognize? What's the difference between a vision and a dream? Uh, for those that I sent the email, I sent you kind of a, an attachment as well that goes through all the dreams of the Bible. There's been 21 dreams throughout the scriptures that have revealed the future or some type of prophecy of what's going to happen. Every single one of those dreams, when you received a dream, you received a dream while you're sleeping. Now, you may think that's obvious, but that's actually the biggest difference between a vision and a dream. When someone receives a vision, they're awake. When someone receives a dream by God, they're asleep. So even that's something that's pretty cool. It teaches us that Daniel didn't receive a dream. He received a vision. Meaning, I don't know how late it was at night, but he would have been praying up until that time. Wow. He didn't go to sleep until he got that mystery from God. Wow. Until he got that answer from God. And what happens even straight after? He doesn't go straight to sleep. It says that he starts to praise God. Okay. He starts to praise him. You know, when is the first time, or when's the last time you kept yourself awake just because you were praying? Not because you were worried. Not because you were thinking or feeling a lot. Because you kept yourself because you were praying. I know I've done that many times. Not the praying bit, the worrying bit. <laughs> Where something happens in the day or something's going to happen tomorrow that I'm scared about. And I just can't go to sleep. I just think about it. I feel about it. I do my little court case and all the things that are going to happen. And yet, when we start to go back and just praise God and pray to God, it changes everything. Yeah. And again, like I said, not only did he just stay awake for praying, but he started to praise God when the vision came. And he alone was doing this. He didn't just straight head to bed after it was answered. I don't know if you've ever done that where you're kind of waiting for a text at night or some type of call or some type of thing and you're kind of, you know, sleeping on the bed but whenever like a notification comes up, you kind of look at it and you go, Millie, stop sending me memes. I'm waiting for a text, you know? And uh, you, you, you have that and, you know, you're just waiting for that text. But what happens straight after you get your answer? You get your answer, oh, hey man, they got home safe. Hey man, it's okay. You go straight to bed. <laughs> That's not what Daniel did. He got his answer and said, I'm spending the rest of the night praising God. Wow. How awesome is that? You know, Psalms 94 verse 19, I'm pretty sure that this would have been something that he would have been feeling. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. On, brought me joy. You know, I don't know what was going on with his friends, but at least says here that he was the only one praising God. Maybe they were there with him, we don't know. But at least says here specifically that Daniel was the only one praising. 
You know, this may have been the only, the only all-night praising prayer throughout the scriptures. We've read about all-night prayers before in Jesus, but he's praying requests. This is the only all-night praise. He started to praise God. Sometimes the difference of receiving a miracle or not can be traced back to how much you're praying and how much you're praising God. And let's see what he praises. What does he say? Verse 20 through 23. Praise be the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He disposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness. And light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made, me, uh, you have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. What I love about this is it doesn't record his prayer of request. It only records his prayer of praise. We don't know how much he prayed about begging God and what that actually sounded like or looked like. And I don't want to dig too, dig too much into it. But I'm just going to safely assume I think it's recorded because I think God liked this prayer more. Yeah. <laughs> More than the prayer of request, God like the prayer of praise. Some of your greatest prayers in your life will not be the ones that God answered and given to you. We may do that, right? What's your greatest prayer? Like when, when, when I prayed for this person to be saved, when I prayed that I can go to this place, when I prayed for a mission team, when I prayed for that and God answered. The greatest prayers of your life are going to be when you praise God afterwards. When you thank him. That's the ones he's going to remember. He's going to remember, I answered it and you thanked me for it. Yeah. My first challenge is that prayer and praise changes everything. Yes. It changes everything. Stop trying to think or feel your way out of a problem. Yeah. It doesn't work. You have to go to God and pray about it. Like Daniel, if you feel like you're not up to the challenge, get your friends to join you. He went over there and explained what was happening, what was going on in his heart. He says, guys, we got to pray. If you feel like not praying, go and get people around you. And when you see the prayer answered, remember to praise God before you go to sleep. Point number two, prayer and praise changes you. Prayer and praise changes you. Chapter 2, verse 24. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon. And he said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret the dream for him. So we'll just, we'll just pause there for a moment. Prayer and praise changes you. See, Daniel's request actually changes now. We remember in the beginning of his prayer, right, or what he warned his friends, what did he say? He said, guys, pray that God will have mercy on us, that we're not going to get executed along with the Babylonians. But at now, he's talking to the king and saying, don't execute anybody. His request changes. He's not just saying, hey, let me go to the king so me and my friends don't die. He's saying, let me go to the king and I, I want to make sure everybody's safe. Wow. And that's pretty crazy. Because he could have made a couple cases, or at least in his heart. He could have gone to the king and said, guys, king, all the other people are fake. Me and my three friends, we're the real ones. Mm -hmm. Those false people who are creating idols, kill them, let me live. Wow. He could have done that. He could have made a case to get his name back. I'm tired of being called, you know, Belshazzar. I can't pronounce it. Let me be Daniel. Right? He could have like, I want my name back. He could have made that request. You don't even think about it. He could have had the opportunity to kill his enemies. Yeah. Yes, there would have been people that were putting God's people to the sword. But these false prophets were putting people before false idols. Wow. Which is kind of even worse. That's what, that's what God judged them for, right? So it's, it's like changing this. Then he goes there and says, I want to save them all. Everybody is worth saving. Everybody is worth saving. And that should be the heart of every disciple. Everyone is worth saving. Yeah, you know, I remember not too long ago I shared with the congregation um, when Sione and myself were sharing our faith. We had this random guy. Uh, I can't remember. I think it's Cameron. And uh, that he was, uh, we were sharing our faith and he randomly started like heckling us and uh, shouting at us uh, and kind of persecuting us as we're sharing our faith. He goes, you know, you don't know about this, God. You're a conspiracy. Da, 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 da. And uh, I shared with you guys of, of my reaction 
reaction. You know, I didn't just kind of rebuke him or anything. I did talk to him about being respectful. But we may go like, you know, why, why, why keep up with that? At the end of the day, my true heart, though he doesn't, may not feel that or not, at the end of the day, I want him to have no excuse to come back to me so I can share my faith with him. Amen. Right? If I would have reacted a crazy different way, he may have gone like, I got under his skin. I got under him. Yeah. But now I still have an opportunity to, amen, at least he's quiet now, but um, still opportunity to talk to this guy. Yeah. Come on, Sean. Because if there's... Like, it should be on our heart. Everyone's worthy of saving. Yeah. But if there's something that most Christians worry about, it's about the salvation of those around us. <laughs> right? It's about who is going to be saved. And this is something that definitely will keep us awake. Yeah. Yeah. When someone's studying the Bible or, or somebody's getting closer to God and we don't know what's really happening in their heart, we'll stay awake. Mm -hmm. We'll be thinking about them. You know? But thank God we don't have to stay awake at least anymore in prayer of request, but now prayer of praise with Daniel getting baptized. <laughs> you know, it, it's not going to be any more staying awake of prayer request, but prayer of praise for this young man making this awesome decision. See, prayer and praise will change you. Yeah. It changed Daniel's heart right here. You know, there's an unseen inner strength in Daniel that's really caused by his faith. While the king is irrational and angry and abrupt, we now start to see Daniel is calm and collected. He wasn't always this way. We found out that maybe he might have had some fear beforehand, but now he's starting to, to, to own up. He's starting to have this, this confidence now. You know, it's funny. The difference before and after someone goes into prayer is crazy. Yeah. Have you ever seen somebody do that? You know, they turn into like Smeagol to like Gollum, yeah. right? If you guys ever seen Lord of the Rings, like the, the, there's like some real changes. You know, it's kind of like sometimes you don't even want to talk to a Christian until they pray, <laughs> right? I, I don't know about you, but you can see a lot of things happen in a Christian household. <laughs> things go down. Uh, you know, people just like go crazy. Like it's a little Smeagol, like, you know, you're my precious and they're hugging you and they're petting you and they're like willing to show you to Mordor they're like yeah let's do it and then next minute they're biting your finger uh, like Gollum and just going crazy you know and have you ever have you ever done that or has somebody ever asked you hey ha have you prayed yet <laughs> oh that's the worst question <laughs> you never want to be asked that question what do you really want to answer yeah I pray that you mind your business you know <laughs> like, we, 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 we don't say that but <laughs> We have that in our heart. We hate being asked, have you prayed about it yet, right? We, we hate it. You know, I prayed you get out of my face, right? Like all of that. And we just have like this attitude and everything. But then you see them go off and they pray and they come back and they kind of have like this sorry on their face, you know? And they like almost bake you like a, a, some cookies and just like, I'm sorry, I feel better. But now you're angry because they were mad before and they gave you an attitude to tell them to pray and now you got to go pray about it. Um, you know, it, and it's just a cycle. <laughs> I really think like life is funny, you know? Um, you know, who, who, who thinks here that they're just a, a lot of bit stupid sometimes? Yeah. Uh, just, uh, you know, do you guys notice that Raph raised his hand? Um, that means we're all in trouble. Uh, but, you know, we, we can be stupid that way. That we just, like, we know the answer is in prayer. We know it's going to change our heart. We know we can do it. We just don't want to. Yeah. Psalms 23, verse 4, it says, Even though I walk through the valley, uh, through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. I would have thought if Daniel and his friends would have started feeling like this now. Like before, this is, this is hard. This is difficult. I don't know if I can do this. And now there's just confidence. I know what the king wants. Call off the decree. I'll change his mind. It all changes when you start to pray. Come on. You know, it's awesome to see uh, Jess uh, for the last couple of weeks. <laughs> and her confidence and her surrender about going back to America. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I'm pretty sure, though, she would have had some Daniel chapter 2, verse 1s, though. A bit of freaking out about it. <laughs> What's going to happen? What's going to go down? Is it going to be okay? Where am I going to live? All these different questions would have been in her mind. But there's a confidence in you now. Yeah. Come on, Jack. Like, I, I know God's with me. This communion today was one of, the, one of my favorite, and I'm definitely going to hold that in my heart. Yeah. Jess, you are 100% a heroine in the faith for this world sector, and we are deeply going to miss you. You know, at the end of this, the king was not going to just listen to some random prophet. Mm -hmm. 
the only reason he was actually going to allow Daniel into his presence is because he had this dream that was so personal, personal that he was bound to pay attention to whatever Daniel was going to say. And he says here in verse 2, 25 through 30, Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell you what the king, uh, what, uh, excuse me, tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, which is called Belshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, musician, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mysteries he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King uh, Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your, de- your dream and the vision that passed through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. Turned up to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what was going to happen. As for, as for me... This mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation, that you may understand what went through your mind. I love this by the end of it. When Daniel is asked, hey, are you sure you can do it? What is his answer? I can't, but God can. (laughs) Very simple. I don't know how to do it. Nobody else can, but God can. How much would this just change our lives if we accepted this truth? Let's go, Sean. You know, the future is full of fear, usually because we compare ourselves to it and ask ourselves, can we do it? Can I do it? Can I show up to that? Am I good enough? Instead, it's saying, I can't, but God can. I can't force myself to repent, but God can. I can't change my heart on this issue, but God can. I can't change his heart or her heart, but God can. I can't soften my heart on this issue, but God can. I can't find a husband, but God can. I can't find the strength. I can't find the faith, but God can. If we understand that, everything will change in our lives. See, what most of us feel is that we're getting stretched. We don't know if we can do it. And that's because you're trying to do what's your ability, but also something that's not your responsibility. Yeah. It's kind of like if you're working in a fast food joint, and your job is just to do the teal. You're supposed to be at the register and take the orders. But we find you in the back trying to cook, and then trying to, trying to like store the, the refrigerators and everything. And you're running around trying to do everything. You're like, I don't know if I can do all this. Mm-hmm. That's the same thing. God's not looking you to, for you to do it. God's like, that's my responsibility. Yeah. You can't do everything. That's my responsibility. Learn your abilities and learn God's responsibilities. If you can learn how to do that, everything will change in your life. Prayer and praise changes you. When you start to stop just going based off of your feelings, off of your thinking, off of your strength and your faith, and go, I'm just going to go to God, you'll see how much it changes you. Come on. In conclusion, Daniel tells the king the dream. And I encourage everybody to read the dream. It's an awesome dream, telling and predicting the coming and, and uh, falling away of different, um, uh, what is it called? Kingdoms that happen throughout the history. And, it, and it's awesome. And see, biblical prophecy is amazing because it's not like a good guess, biblical prophecy. It's actually good news to a guessing world. It's telling like what God decrees and what he's going to do. John 14 verse 29 says, I have told you this now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. Right, that was the point of prophecy, to get them to start having faith. By the end of this prophecy though, dropping down to Daniel chapter chapter 2, verse 46 through 47, we see how King Nebuchadnezzar reacts to this. It says, Then the King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor in order that an offering and incense be presented to him. How awesome is that? Before the king was threatening him, now he's paying him honor going down on all fours. That is awesome. And that would be a sight to see. But I do want to encourage you with this. This means nothing. The next chapter, his life is already getting threatened again. If we're looking to wait for people to praise us and think that that's going to change, if people change, if all these other things change, if my, go- if my uh, boss or my parents or they start to agree with me, it's going to change. It, 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 you can't be banking on that. Yeah. Yeah. 
It, do, it doesn't matter about that. It's are you standing with God? Because at one moment, yes, he's bowing down before Daniel. The next moment, he's throwing him into a lion's den. Yeah. It, it means nothing to get recognition from the world. Instead, it is all about us praising and coming to God. Yeah. See, the, the world offers us no comfort with this recognition. The only comfort we can have is when we go to God in prayer. And I hope that all of us can start to learn how to do this in our own lives. Instead of getting kept awake by our thoughts and feelings, we are kept awake by our prayers and praise. And we can all feel this in Psalm 34, verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Thank you very much. Yeah.